Hi everybody, this is Noelle from Petiti Garden Centers and we're doing what's in store for April. And oh my gosh, it's a really crisp, very cold morning, but there is a lot to see at the garden center. You can see all of the pansies here um, right next to me. Beautiful, large flowering pansies with the face. Remember pansies, a little bit bigger flower, violas, a little bit smaller flower, same family, same great cold crop. If you want color now, you can plant them now. Hopefully the area that you're planting is draining pretty well, okay, but you can plant them in the garden, but they're great for containers right now, hanging baskets, window boxes, any porch or patio pot, awesome. So try your pansies. Some of them have a little bit of a scent to them too. So that's really great. Lots of different spring colors there. And then also another great cold crop that you can focus on right now are some of your early veggies, okay? So again, your leaf lettuces, this is actually our um, wildfire mix. So it has a little bit more of the red and green uh, leaf lettuces, but definitely more red that you see here. And again, your lettuce will grow so well in containers right now, no problem. We usually go between, or I usually go between two or three different bowls. I've got, um, this is actually a, um, Kale, sorry, my brain is not working. So kale, this is prism. And then also I have a spinach here. This is thai -y spinach. And if you go among and harvest, and when you do harvest these, remember, you're just chopping the leaves or cutting the leaves as you need around the plant, leaving about an inch of space at the bottom because they'll re-sprout and grow for you. So I usually will grab the entire clump of plant and I'll just start to cut around or cut the whole uh, clump and then leave that inch of space and then go ahead, wash and, and ready to go, ready to eat. But you can harvest from two or three different bowls and those, that, those leaves and those lettuces will keep on coming up and producing. So it's awesome. Another cold crop that we have are the bulbs, of course. And you say, you know, normally you have to plant these in the fall to get that spring color with your tulips, your hyacinth, your daffodils. Guess what? If they're like this, if they've been planted and they start to force, you can enjoy the bulbs indoors or out, whatever you prefer at this time of year. And then go ahead and plant them after they're done blooming in the garden. So it's really a great way to get your spring color and then also get some bulbs into the ground. And now you see some of the beautiful perennials. These are kind of your early spring bloomers. But again, I talk about this plant a lot and we have a spotlight on hellebores or Lenten roses. Um, many of these are actually earlier blooming than some of your classic Lenten roses, believe it or not. They sort of crossbred with um, snow roses or Christmas roses earlier blooming, like winter blooming types with some of the Lenten roses. So some of these come out in the landscape in February, um, most of the time March. Uh, but look at all the colors. I mean, there are some gorgeous varieties here. New ones, usually at Petites, when you see new perennials, they're gonna be in a blue pot. So I have Rosado here, which is, gosh, just a, kind of a mottled cream and sort of um, pinky red, really, really beautiful. Um, ice and snow, this is the white, beautiful, beautiful. When you look at hellebores and this type of growth, what's really cool about these, these varieties in particular is they grow up, they branch, and then the flowers are looking out at you versus kind of pendulous down. So you'll see some uh, other types of hellebores that are sort of pendulous flowering, but these will stick out at you. So they're really great plants. And guys, they are so deer resistant. If you have problems with deer and you wanna grow some flowering plants, hellebores will really do well for you. Um, they love part shade, shaded conditions, believe it or not. You can grow them in the full sun, um, but you need to keep them a little bit more moist and that's fine. Um, but again, just think about it. And the foliage, this foliage is really thick, evergreen, really kind of stays around the plant. So you're getting this continuous interest from this plant, foliage, flowering. They're just so wonderful and really, really long lived in the garden. So 20 years, 30 years, I mean, they're a great plant. As we keep going through perennials, 
again, you're gonna see pops of color here and there. Again, these are spring ephemerals, so they're gonna start blooming early, but this one's pretty cool over here. This is actually a Shasta Daisy. It's called White Lion. It is pretty new for us, very compact, about eight inches tall when it is fully filled out. Standard Shasta, so really pretty white petals, yellow center on this daisy. Again, our daisy family does really nicely for us um, in Northeast Ohio, good deer resistance, good bunny resistance, um, again, and will attract the, the pollinators. But I have to say this daisy is one of the earliest blooming, so you're gonna start to see those buds pop open, okay? Now, with perennials at this time of year, you wonder if you can plant. The caveat here is that as long as your soil is draining and you, you're not making a muddy mess when you're digging and so forth, that's really what you're looking for. So you can plant perennials that have come out in the garden center, no problem. If they're blooming and we get a really hard freeze, cover them up so you're, you're protecting those blooms, okay, or buds. Um, Lenten rose, you don't have to worry about at all. Um, but to be honest, that, that's gonna help that longevity of that flower. So if we get that really, really hard freeze, you might wanna protect them in the ground. Right now, we're growing them in containers and planting, again, window boxes, patio containers, and so forth, because you can grow them in the containers for spring and then go ahead and move them out in the garden when you're ready, when the soil is ready, and you're ready to you know, really dig and get out there too. So you've got those options that you can use. Always love the candy tuff. Beautiful sort of semi-succulent plant, really good for sun uh, areas, kind of rocky areas, more gritty areas. Oh, really neat, sweet scent on them as well. More of a ground cover type, but again, really tough because it'll, they'll do very, very nicely and more of those drier, you know, heavier heat areas. And they grow really, really well with like lavenders, some of the other more, um, if you will, water-wise plants, uh, euphorbias. We've got the mossy saxifrage over here too. And I know I've talked about that as well. So all of these plants grow very, very nicely together. The geum are popping up. They're so beautiful. This is firestorm, really, really lovely lovely longer stems still in the garden, maybe only about 18 inches tall. So not a tall, tall plant, but again, good fuzzy foliage, beautiful sort of that um, really pretty kind of zucchini yellow or golden yellow flowers. But if you need, you know, an early kind of spot of that golden orange, this is a great plant to try. Again, for sunny areas, they can take part sun as well, but good sunny spot is always nice for them. And then we're starting to see early color on the gallardias. So these are your native blanket flowers. I should say native are, so cultivated variety of a native, but blanket flower is a native. It's a native plant to Ohio. And the spin top series for us has been super awesome at returning, really filling out and blooming very, very long throughout the season. There's a bunch of different colors beautiful doubled petals on the outside, big showy dark eye in the middle and really compact growing. So again, blanket flowers, once established, they really can be a wonderful abuse tolerant plant, fairly good as far as deer resistance is concerned too. So really, really awesome. Do you want me to look at that mossy saxifrage, Taylor? So here's the white and the pink. Um, this one is scenic red, scenic white, Beautiful sort of um, succulent foliage at the base. Really pretty, just uh, very petite flowering on these guys. But again, great sign of spring. Awesome to put in containers or in the ground as an edger. Really, really awesome. And of course, your violas. So many of these perennial violas are the ones that are going to return fairly reliably in your garden. A little bit larger flowering a little bit more breeding with some of your native violas here as well. So look for all of these different varieties and colors in the perennial section, okay? A little bit different genetics here when it comes to the perennial violas versus more of the annual violas. But again, very, very cold tolerant crops. So you don't have to cover these. They will do their thing outside 
no problem whatsoever, okay? Lots of dianthus also starting. Um, you'll see everything from doubled small carnations like uh, first scent varieties and series all the way through singles. Uh, the PW here, this is Paint the Town. This was actually a uh, perennial of the year last year. Beautiful single kind of deep rose flowers really fragrant on this one. I'm, I'm getting a, just a good scent, just kind of being close to it right now. Very, very petite habit, very tough habit again, more for those sunny, well-drained spots um, and very nice. It'll fill out about twice its width. So again, look for Paint the Town and some of the other Dianthus, but remember that they always like to be in those full sun areas, well-drained areas. And most of the varieties now are just really good repeat bloomers. They will start early if they get some good sun, some good heat in the spring, and then they might be less blooming as we get into the heat, heat of summer, but many of them just will keep on going, keep out pushing out those buds and blooms for you to enjoy. Taylor spotted a really pretty Pieris japonica, or also known as Japanese Andromeda, uh, quite a few names there, but we've done a little spotlight on those as well. And they're, they're really a great evergreen family, very broadleaf evergreen. So you will see these leaves on these plants year round. And when they do start to develop in the spring, they're one of the earliest spring bloomers out of that, that broadleaf evergreen uh, family, if you will, type of plant. And so with Pieris japonica, they have these little bell-like flowers. And this variety is called Katsura. And look at these bells. They're really, really gorgeous. I'm sure Taylor will give you a close-up, but um, beautiful white into a, a kind of a pink opening or nozzle on these uh, bell flowers. They're really gorgeous. Um, and again, early blooming with these, very, very showy. And then with Pierre Stepanica, the new foliage will come after the flowering is occurred and um, it will start to fill out. And Katsura, when the new foliage comes out, it's like a bronzy color and it will be bronze for those early stages. And then as it matures, it will start to green up and darken in green color. But again, low growing, sort of amorphous shaped with Pierre Stepanica. They're not quite a round mound and um, they're not really cone or they're sort of amorphous, um, but really great plant for part shade again or shadier gardens. So I really want you to focus on uh, probably six hours or less Northern exposure, Eastern expo exposure are really good. It's tough to grow them in West because they tend to dry out a little bit more with that intense sun and heat. Um, but again, well-drained soils, acidic soils. So we feed these guys with halitone, um, but this one is gorgeous. Katsura, I don't think we've ever grown before. So take a look. Plants are arriving out here in the nursery. So we're out back in Oakwood Village and um, we've got some junipers getting offloaded right now, but there's plenty. There's arborvitae, there's hollies, uh, Texas. Oh my gosh, so much out here. And of course the boxwood are out here as well. Um, behind Taylor, she's got blueberries, raspberries. So again, it's really not too early to plant. Everything's ready to go. It's just, it's the fact that you always have to wait for your soil to be ready. So again, just, I know I've, I'm sounding like a broken record, but make sure that your soil is well drained before you start digging in it, amending it, you know, all those types of things. What we can do out in soil right now is we can definitely feed our plants. So again, for the most part, if you have evergreens out there in the garden, you can feed them holly tone and iron tone, okay? Give them a little bit of a, a start here for spring. With all the moisture, it's gonna move into the root system pretty well. If you have a non-evergreen plant, we usually feed them plant tone and iron tone. Again, get them off right, um, get them started, you know, give them a little bit of a uh, get up and go for the spring to get them starting to push out new leaves and new foliage and so forth. So that's really, really good. Beautiful. The Texas are gorgeous this year. Um, columnar types, you know, your Hicks U here, a little bit smaller types as far as the dense U's are concerned. So um, definitely, uh, I think they're kind of making a comeback, Taylor. We're, we're starting to see yews um, out there. And I think a lot of people are just kind of renovating maybe an older foundation planting that's really become overgrown. 
and starting with something a little bit smaller and um, spacing them out a little bit better so you don't get a, a big kind of jumbled mess. So that's that's also something we're seeing out there. Um, look at all the arborvitaes are coming out as well. So um, if you're looking for some upright growth for sure green giants here again green giants are going to be your western arborvitae very deer resistant as far as browsing is concerned very very dark green very fast grower as well so if you're looking for a little bit of natural screen and some shading um, this would be a great plant for you. For those of you that have hydrangea trees, so your panicle hydrangea trees, obviously grown up um, with a trunk and then you have the panicle hydrangea on top. I wanted to show you, it's, it's a really good time to prune them. If you haven't done so already, it's fine. Um, that's one of those hydrangeas, the panicle hydrangeas that we can prune while it's dormant. And um, what we normally say, and Angelo says this all the time, is you're looking to prune them to about an eight to 10 inch basketball. So when you look at the canopy of the tree and it's you know grown much larger uh, last season, you know, and you left the flowers and what have you, the branches up over the fall and into the winter months. And now you're looking at the plant without any foliage. Now you can go ahead and you can trim it to that round sort of ball shape, if you will. And it doesn't have to be exactly eight. It doesn't have to be exactly 10, but this is the type of shape you're looking for. So if you look down our hydrangea tree lines, they're all fine. They're very, very cold hardy. Um, but look at, they're all kind of that ideal rounded ball shape on top. And that's exactly what we want because we want them to branch out from there, develop their flowers, stay nice and, and tight, if you will, and dense, and they'll all do it. So Taylor can pan down the whole, uh, all these rows here, and there's all different varieties. There's quick fire, pinky winky, um, so all the different varieties, but they all have that nice, beautiful, rounded top. So that's what you wanna do at home. We know spring is here and it, it's taken its time. Um, and of course, one of our first signs of spring is for Scythia. Now this is a, a short shorty, okay? This is show off sugar baby. So this is gonna be your shortest for Scythia. And we've done a little spotlight on Forsythia as well. So check that video out. Um, but again, when you see those Forsythia blooms, oh my gosh, you know spring's right around the corner. Actually, it's technically here, but we're just starting to start the flowering season, I guess I should say. And um, just remember in April, there's still not a lot of food out there, natural forage for birds. So still make sure that you're cleaning the feeders, but keeping them full for the birds. Um, again, they're out here, they're really, really happy on sunny days, and uh, they do need uh, some, some feed to get them through April. It's still a pretty tough month for them, so keep that in mind. Uh, we've got some great house plants, and you probably recognize these. They're, these are elephant ears or alocasia. And what's really cool about this plant family is that growers are starting to use them as a house plant year round. So you can grow these indoors, keep them indoors year round, of course, or transition them outside for um, some cool sort of texture, leaf color, all those types of things outdoors in containers on a covered porch and patio. Don't get me wrong, they really don't want to be out in full sun and hot conditions. Um, they are tropical plants, but you're looking at partial shade, shaded conditions, consistent moisture. The alocasia can take a little bit more drought than most of your like caladium, um, Colocasia family. So those are the ones that want more moisture. Alocasia can take consistent, but a little bit drier. Okay. So keep those in mind. It makes them a little bit easier for us to grow. Um, also high humidity. Okay. So again, our summers get really humid, which they love, but keep them in a shaded spot and indoors kind of bright to medium and direct lighting should be fine for them. And there's so many new Variety. So this is Nessie. She's kind of a, a miniature poly. If, if anyone's um, heard us talk about that before, the African mask type of alocasia. So Nessie's a little miniature. Look at this is Wenty. So that's a really big green, dark green leaf, a little bit more of a kind of a bronzy burgundy underside here. 
dragon scale we love because of the color and the texture of that leaf, but you have to check this one out. And I'm gonna set this one down really quick. And Taylor doesn't like this one, but I'm gonna show you. This is mellow and it almost feels like, I don't know, like a reptile skin. Like it's really, really thick, really cool grooves in this leaf, but I think it's really cool. Okay, so there's so many to look at, lots of different varieties of allocation. And again, use them inside and out. You'll love them. The Easter holidays, uh, well on its way here. So you'll find a lot of different Easter plants and color and all those beautiful things to decorate your home, decorate your garden as well. Gerbera daisies, always a great sunny, uh, wonderful little daisy. Really, really great annual plant. Don't put it outside yet, okay? Make sure that you're enjoying this one inside in a uh, very bright window. Um, and also they really do prefer that Eastern exposure. So the morning sun versus the evening sun, they'll do much better. Um, just even to slightly dry as far as watering is concerned. And then this cute little Easter combo, I loved it with the Calancho or Calancoe. And then also this fern, um, one of the drier ferns, cause it's a holly fern. Um, so again, watering wise, just um, if you will, water thoroughly and then let it go a little bit drier before you reapply watering. Okay, so keep that in mind as well when you're taking care of your Easter plants. But um, there's always so many interesting things. And we wanted to show you this one. So this is an ornithogallum and um, it's, they're calling it sun star for a common name. And again, it's a, it's a type of bulb. It's, it's forced um, out of the ground. And um, again, just a really unusual, unique flower. Um, there's other types of ornithogallon. Um, Sometimes we call them Star of Bethlehem. They're usually white to a, like a little bit of a lavender blue. Um, but again, kind of neat, unusual. Again, just forced for uh, the Easter holiday and um, enjoy.